The land that we're on, the people who came before us, um, those who were in pursuit of safety, okay? Those who have provided us an avenue to even have this discussion today. I'm going to ask you to think about what is physical safety to you? What is emotional safety? What is environmental safety? Safety means different things to different people. When we met as a, as a group to talk about what safety meant to us, it caused us to reflect on some very um, important reference points over the past 10 or 15 years. And so I'm just going to frame our thinking around those reference points. The Virginia Tech tragedy. The Dear Colleague letter on bullying and harassment. The Dear Colleague letter on sexual violence. The founding of the Cougar Care Network. Presidential elections. And matters of free speech. The Apodaca lawsuit. White supremacy. The Poway shooting, the arson at the Islamic Center in Escondido.
the convening of OIE workshops, innovating the future of the UPD task force, the creation of the timely public incident response task force, elections that will be happening next week. And safety today as it relates to anti-Semitic activity, school shootings, bomb threats, mental health issues with our students, and workplace threats and workplace violence. That takes us to an opportunity to have a conversation with our panel members. Today's format is going to be a little bit different than a town hall. It's going to be, be more like information sharing with some questions in between, an opportunity to engage, and then we'll wrap it up at the end. So with that, I want to pass the opportunity for our Dean of Students, Jason Schreiber, to share his thoughts and information. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the CARE team. Um, the CARE team is similar to what at other institutions might be a behavioral intervention team. It might be a threat assessment team. And we have had uh, some form of a CARE team in place since before Virginia Tech. So it's actually been in place for quite a long time here at Cal State San Marcos. Um, the team really focuses on um, assessment, response, and education, um, and really looks at behavioral issues that put, uh, pose a concern or a potential threat um, to self or others. And so the, the team is a cross-divisional team that really works uh, to ensure the safety of our students and also our campus community. Um, we often get questions about how things are referred to the, the care team, and that is done through the Cougar Care Network um, through a referral form, or it is directly um, to the Dean of Students Office or the University Police Department. Um, as I said, the team really focuses on um, coordinating responses for distressing disruptive, potential harmful situations, but also looks at um, anticipating situations and also providing wraparound care for our students. And so really focused um, majority of the time on making sure students um, get the care that they need in a coordinated effort, um, but also acts as a threat assessment um, team as necessary. The next slide is a uh, slide of the care team members, and as I described, it is a cross-divisional team. This team meets every other week, um, and this uh, slide shows you a little bit about who's on um, this team. Uh, the team is trained um, and has gone through some extensive training um, in terms of doing some team development, but also doing some very specific work around threat assessment um, through utilizing tools called Waiver 21. Um, we also utilize um, the training and uh, resources of a forensic psychologist. And then um, most recently, this team was trained on terrorism and um, extremism. So. Uh, there's a lot of behind the scenes uh, that goes into this team um, and really, really tries to make sure that our students are successful and um, really get the care that they need. The team also coordinates um, things because sometimes um, things happen in pockets and this pulls all of that information together in the same place. Um, the care team is coordinated um, and co-chaired by the uh, chief of police and also the um, fine person sitting next to me, the director of our Title IX and DHR area, but also in her function as the associate, direct, associate vice president of student affairs. So that's a little bit about the care team. Any questions, or am I not taking questions right now about yeah, the care we can, team? Yeah, we can have a few questions. Um, I would like to, to ask you myself, how effective do you believe the care team has been 
in response to um, our campus issues in general? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, that, which is a difficult question. Um, oftentimes, we, we have talked about that if you don't know that um, something is happening, then we did our, our work to support that student um, and help them get be successful. Um, we're also trying to anticipate as much as we can. Um, we also realize that we can't catch everything and, and situations also can't completely be um, anticipated or stopped. So um, I would say though the team has been really successful and oftentimes um, we are watching folks graduate or move on to the next step of their life and knowing that a, a group of uh, dedicated and caring individuals um, were a part of helping um, those folks uh, be successful. But um, yeah, it's really hard to um, assess our success. Um, and I would invite either one of you to also just answer that question, but um, it's re very rewarding and challenging work in terms of sitting on the team. And it's, it's heavy work. Heavy lifting, heavy work. And a lot goes on behind the scenes, yes. uh, it sounds like. Yep. Okay, thank you. We'll, we'll take some questions um, in just a, a moment. Let's move on. Uh, I would like to invite um, Dr. Blanchin. Is this your slide or? Oh, I'm sorry. Chief Flores, go ahead. Hello, good afternoon. Can you all hear me? All right, thank you. As uh, Dean Schreiber was mentioning, uh, the police department is part of that care team. Uh, our role is investigating and partnering with uh, members of our campus community and care team to investigate any, place, any instances of workplace violence and or threat to self-harm. Um, you, the question was posed by Dr. Oswald Allen regarding our, our success rate or, or what have you. I'm gonna provide an example of some of our partnerships. We do partner with the local law enforcement agencies throughout San Diego County, right, to follow up on any cases of uh, uh, threats and or self-harm. Uh, we partner with our state, local, and federal partners. Uh, one instance, if, for example, we had a student during the Zoom, uh, when we were all in Zoom, who commented about self-harm. The student was in, I believe, San Antonio, Texas. So what we did at that particular point, we identified who the student was, potentially where they may be, and started coordinating with local law enforcement agencies in that area to get the, the student the help they needed, which they did. And that was one that just comes to mind. That just is to provide a little bit of context as to the complexity of some of these cases is, and the amount of work that goes on behind the scenes to coordinate help and assistance in tracking down people. You know, and which brings us to, to that end of what we're currently talking about, the recent safety recommendations and outcomes. Uh, our University Police Department is working with the various campus constituents to improve safety. And safety, as Dr. Allen posed, uh, it's, it means something different to everyone, right? Uh, as part of the uh, UPD task force, there was a UPD engagement group that was formed. And I recall, uh, that there was some type of survey that was posed to the campus community. I don't know to what extent, whether it was students, for example, for sure, but it talked and asked specifically what the safety concerns for them were. Uh, some of the concerns and the key themes that came back to us regards to safety were housing and security, right? Food and security and mental health, right? So those are some of the key things that came back to us as far as what their, the campus community perception of safety was or where they wanted the safety to go. Uh, Dr. Ellen Oswald posed and spoke about some of the active shooter incidents, right, that are going across the nation. To that end, what we have done is we've, we've done our due diligence and tried to ensure that we've posted posters like you see the one there on, on that uh, east wall that talks about addressing emergencies and how to respond to certain emergencies in the classrooms. Uh, we've also attempted to put the evacuation routes throughout the buildings on campus, and as well as every classroom is uh, actually equipped with a panic safety or a notification button on the desktop itself. It's called the desktop alert. And what that does essentially is it sends an alert directed to our communications dispatch center, right? And that tells us what the classroom location is and we're hopefully able to connect with a person via phone call. If a phone call does not come through, officers respond immediately to that location to try to address those situations. Thanks, Chief. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Okay. Can you tell us um, how, how, how well do you believe um, 
the actions that uh, the police department on campus has taken um, has um, affected the culture on campus in general. What are your thoughts about the actions of the police based on these recommendations in the campus culture? Thank you, Dr. Os Alan Oswald. Um, our police department is, has been very intentional in the recruitment and hiring of police officers. Uh, the past, I would say the last four candidates are actually alum of Cal State San Marcos, and we recruited them within other departments. One worked in HR, one worked in student success, and the other ones are alum from our campus, campus community. So that was very intentional, you know, in connecting and ensuring that our officers can identify with our faculty, staff, and students, number one, to maintain that connection. What we also have done is we've been very intentional about connecting with our group and student centers. Obviously, COVID had an impact on the ability for us to connect, and we're hoping that now that we are in person, we can continue that to ensure our success and to ensure our, our collaboration across the different departments, different campus constituents, and student and, and faculty staff centers. It's very interesting, thank you. Um, I know many um, campuses don't have the, the, the privilege or opportunity to hire from, um, from within or from their own you know, student body um, graduate pool. Um, <clears throat> I, I've learned through my own experience that when people aren't part of the community that they're serving or protecting, the way they approach their, their role is, is different uh, in, in many respects. So um, <clears throat> perhaps that's something we could talk about in the future. Um, thank you. Let's move on. Now, um, Chief, we have a slide here that talks about PERT mental health. Is there anything you want to, or is this for um, AVP Blanchin or Chief Flores? It's a combination of both. Okay. I'll let Dr. Blanchin, take All the right. first. Go at it. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, so, a couple of years ago, um, the president charged a task force with really looking at um, practices of policing um, and, and looking at things broadly. So how do we respond to crisis on campus, in particular mental health crisis? Um, knowing that we are very much like campuses across the country, um, student and uh, employee mental health challenges are increasing in frequency and also complexity. Uh, and how, how can we do that um, in a way that is, um, provides us opportunity to, uh, for prevention, and you've heard um, both Jason and Jesse speak to that. Um, intervention, uh, which was, we were very grateful a year ago to have funding coming from the California legislature directed to mental health across the CSU. Um, and so we've been able to deploy those funds to increase our counseling faculty and student health and counseling. And directly related to the task force for innovating a, a police department for the future, uh, really was looking at the, the crisis response. So our UPD is, is the end all be all 911 for our campus. Um, so if we have a concern for a crime, if we have a concern for a physical um, life safety concern, someone um, is potentially having a health emergency, um, if someone is having a mental health crisis, um, 911 goes to our um, talented team, and they have to kind of—they bear the burden of of being a bit uh, of everything to everyone. So we wanted to borrow from the models that we are seeing increasingly in our county, but also um, in law enforcement um, organizations, probably across the state, maybe across the nation. Jesse, Jesse can speak to that. Um, and borrow from what's called the Psychiatric Emergency Response Team model. Um, and so in doing so, um, we discussed opportunities within the task force, uh, in particular folks that really focused on this um, were, I believe, Jesse and uh, our former chief, Lamine Seca, um, Dr. Ali Peters, who is our director of counseling and sex services, um, and me really talked about how can we um, further formalize the partnership that exists between student health and counseling and um, our UPD. So last spring, um, Jesse and I went had the good um, opportunity to visit Academic Senate. We visited with um, our counseling 
folks at Student Health and Counseling. Uh, we did a number of kind of um, visits to get input into what we are calling um, a crisis response team. And so we presently have um, the director of the crisis response team position is posted. Uh, we look forward to um, getting to know folks who will apply for that role. The director position and the team, and it's a team of, a mighty team of two, um, will be, uh, have a direct reporting line to the chief of police and a dotted line um, to Dr. Ali Peters for that clinical connection. Um, so we're, we're likely looking, um, the, the qualifications are fairly broad, but I often, when I think about this role, I think about certainly someone who is trained and skilled in crisis intervention from a mental health practitioner perspective, um, and then they will be partnered with an officer to respond. Um, because we know that um, mental health or any kind of crisis is very, very fluid. Um, and so we want um, to never lose sight of um, the safety aspect of a response while that provider um, mental health person would be the face of most responses. Um, so that we're very fortunate to be able to fund the director position um, from a, uh, a, a salary line that was previously dedicated to a sergeant role in UPD. Um, and then that mental health money that I mentioned earlier uh, will fund uh, the person who will report to the director. So um, we are, we're getting up and running um, and really look forward to bringing that, that service to campus. Thanks. Did you want to share anything, uh, Chief? Yes, thank you, Dr. Blatcher, for that brief on, on the process for PERT. One of the things that came up as a result of the discussion was the police officer involvement, which is why we're looking for another person to be paired up with an officer. Um, I just wanted to share with you all that uh, mental health across the nation, and in particular in our county, is at an all-time high, and the resources are very, very thin and waning. Uh, San Diego County PERT, uh, last I spoke with the director who runs the San Diego County PERT team, they were down 12 positions, 12 PERT clinicians that they are not able to uh, hire for. That's for San Diego County. And when we have a mental health call, uh, our first call is to call that PERT team, right? That's our primary response to see if there's a PERT team available uh, within San Diego County, which typically is in either Escondido or uh, the San Diego County substation here at San, Mar San Marcos. They have PERT teams, but as I mentioned, there may be one that's already busy on another call at which point our officers do respond. And the whole point and purpose of, of uh, posting an officer or having an officer accompany uh, the clinician is that the officer has the legal duty to place somebody on a 72 hour hold. So it's more of the legal aspect of it, right? But also uh, just the safety component. Uh, I know throughout North San Diego County, there is uh, a program called uh, Mobile Crisis Response and that's something that the San Diego County is looking at and partnering. It was very specifically allocated to the North Coastal area, which is Encinitas, but even they are having a hard time. They do not have an officer that accompanies them, which is what the, the, the key point was to that team. Unfortunately, that we're trying to get the data with respect to how many calls they're able to respond to where there's not an officer requested, right? So that's the other component to that. Thanks, thank you both. So, so if we think about the um, trajectory that, that our, our nation, our region, and our community has been on, um, we've, we've gone through a series of incidents uh, over the last 15 or, or so years that, that have directed us to consider um, shifting our, our ideal of, of police being everything to all people, um, more towards a um, crisis response um, model that includes not only police officers, but uh, mental health professionals and um, other professionals from the community that can support um, a healthy working and learning um, environment, you know, for specifically for this campus is what we're looking at here. Um, and there are some other steps to that. And, and when you think about those other steps, it, it's important to think about the context. 
Um, we are just not out of a pandemic. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't dare say that. I think uh, we have pro professionals here that that are moving us out, um, but we're not quite over the finish line. Um, perhaps we may be learning to live with the um, spread of illness as healthy as we can, but these impacts have affected the mental health of our entire um, world, okay? So CSUSM is not special in that regard. However, it is our responsibility to learn how to take appropriate approaches to support uh, the health of our community members. So with that in mind, we have a second part to this um, innovating the future of UPD um, dynamic here. So Ariel, would you like to share? Yes, thank you, Dr. Allen. So I also was a member of, um, among the Innovating the Future of UPD um, committee. We are some representatives that were members. It was a campus-wide um, committee that was faculty, staff, and students um, were a part of it. And then our, our focus really for the holistic piece was to think about what does it mean to have a holistic approach um, to public safety that fosters trust for students, faculty, staff, um, while also advancing our commitment to inclusive excellence and anti-racism. Um, the committee was definitely a spirited committee for the holistic group. I'm looking at Jason because he was there with me. And the students were very um, vocal in what that looked like for them. So we wanted, to, although we did have members um, that were students that were a part of the committee, we also welcomed student presentations to the, um, to the committee because we wanted to try to have a holistic view for many aspects of our campus. Um, so I wanted to make sure you knew that there was good representation um, as far as the whole campus was um, concerned. Um, in order to really understand um, what it means to have trust or what safety is for folks, we did some data collection. Um, we did a three-year review um, that was focused on mental health um, and mental health related calls, and that really informed the PERT piece um, and the hiring pieces. So I think that's important to note. In addition to that, we also partnered with the Campus Climate Work Group at the time to ask some specific questions. We asked the committee, as well as our Title IX office, to identify some questions that they wanted to ask the entire, I'm looking at Dominique and she's shaking and nodding her head yes, because she is the survey analyst and she was also a part of that work group, to really get some information and data to be data informed about the process. Um, so that definitely occurred. In addition, we also came to the agreement just around training that our campus at the basic level, having implicit bias training was important. And so we started with our senior managers, our PAT members all had just the introduc introductory um, implicit bias training. We work with our faculty, we offered it to our staff. There were different um, implicit bias training, even trainings with our um, community officers, CSOs, community service officers. Um, because we thought even at the basic level, that's very important for the way that we approach it. Um, and also, in addition, the way that people view safety, again, I'm repeating what was already said many times, is different depending on the person, their experiences. Um, safety for the safety people in the room that I see and how they approach it and what they do um, versus safety for UPD versus mental safety are different aspects of safety. And so this group had a larger charge that they were really trying to wrap around. And so when we talk about holistically, what does that mean in terms of inclusive excellence and anti-racism, what's important to know is that it's ongoing, right? Uh, we did come up with some recommendations and some information that were um, specific around UPD housing um, partnerships and patrols and escorts for safety. Um, we also talked about what does it mean to clarify the UPD complaint process. Um, in addition to that, what does it mean also for our UPD, our UPD to be able to communicate um, and have support around how they communicate with the community and the community and the community communicates back with them. Um, I know that those are also things that are being worked on. Um, do they need a communication specialist that's specific to their department in their area? Um, we also the review of some of our um, policies around security and video and what does that mean 
for the campus specifically as well as the system. Um, and then, um, sorry, security also with our contracts and employees. Um, I don't think people al always know that those are additional policies um, upon review. And reviewing policy was also a significant part of this committee um, that we had to do. The, and also thinking about the time, people also had direct concerns around Zoom bombing. Um, faculty were concerned around just cameras um, and what it meant to be in virtual teaching at that time. Don't forget what happened, with, what was going on with COVID, but then we had some additional things happening directly on campus. And so we were trying to capture those things with data. Um, we did do a lot of the the trainings, um, the partnerships, um, reviewing the complaint processes and hirings. And so just wanting to note that that portion of the committee um, did those things. And then I wanna look at um, our interim chief. If you wanted to add anything here, you're more than welcome to. Thank you, Ariel. So Ariel touched base on some of the stuff that we talked about in the committee. I'm gonna focus on a little bit of some of the trainings that we provide from the UPD side. We provide active shooter training right? Uh, we also provide emergency operations center training for your personnel and staff, uh, safety escorts, right? Some of the training that our officers uh, are tasked to and actually have to abide by. Every, every police officer uh, that goes to the police academy has a specific section within their learning block that has to do with implicit bias, right? So that is the foundational from the police academy already from the, its inception. Once they come to our campus, we have our implicit buy-in training that we provide as well, as well as we're looking at expanding that to Ariel so she can provide that to our group as well. Uh, some of the intentional uh, outreach that we've done, we partner, as uh, formerly mentioned, with some of the student centers and, and, and get that connection and that one-on-one -on -one person interaction with our uh, police officers and our department itself. Because um, we want to build and continue to build on the partnerships that we have thus far because we understand that those are the key to improving the relationships across our campus and across, uh, across our students, faculty, and staff. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that was brought to my attention, uh, it was a formal, former uh, colleague and employee of our campus who, when I first got here, made a comment to me, and it was, it was an aha moment for me. Uh, formerly, it was Dr. Jeffrey Gilmore. And he said, hey, Jesse, I just want to, I want to pull you aside and talk to you for a bit. And I said, yeah, what's up, Dr. G? That's what I call him, Dr. G, right? And he said, I just want you to know that I really appreciate the way that we talk and we interact. And the reason why is because my experience with law enforcement wasn't as positive, right? And your interaction with me changed my outlook on law enforcement. And that was like a wow moment for me, right? And I think about that every time I come to work because it's those things that gives me chills just thinking about it, that it makes it has a significant impact. But quite conversely, it also poses the challenge, right? As this is our UPD, this is how we respond to our campus community. The concern for me is when those students, faculty, staff, staff return to their homes and perhaps their interactions aren't as positive, right? So that is something that we have to strive. Uh, I work with Ariel on various uh, meetings. We had uh, difficult conversations, right? Challenging conversations with different student groups and organizations. Um, I mean, with Dr. Martin Leva uh, with Transitions Collective, right? Because I want the interaction between the students and our officers to be seamless, just like any other student, right? Uh, when the DACA, became an issue and the Border Patrol was on campus. We worked with that to encourage that there was perhaps another law enforcement uh, job fair to keep a little bit separate, right? These are all things that we work from very intentional and we work through those things. I know that sometimes it could get lost upon us of what is the university doing? But just know that the, the, the panel members up here are really working tirelessly in the backgrounds to make these positive changes. So I appreciate that. Thank you. And guess what? There's more people than just this panel that's working on this. I mean, you all are working on this. And, and there's so many um, of our community members across campus that are working to create a safe environment. And, and I appreciate you. I want you to know that. And I think we all do. Um, we have about ten min eight minutes left. Uh, I want to know if there are any questions or any topics that you want us to be sure to touch on before we conclude today. This will not be the only conversation we have. I think what we wanted to do today was level set 
our knowledge around what's happening on campus, the historical context, and perhaps um, how might we go forward together? Um, any questions before we transition? Yes. Hi, for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Erin. Most of you know me. Um, quick thought as we're talking about the behavioral intervention team, and we've been lucky enough on this campus, Knockwood, to not have um, workplace violent issues that I'm aware of, not too many. Have we thought, and some of you are going to hear this familiar refrain from me from other committees about my presenteeism stuff, have we thought about organizationally embracing a policy that allows people to use their sick time for mental health days, not just physical health days? Forcing people to come to campus when they don't want to work, not only is bad for them, it might be bad for us. Presenteeism. Um, being there physically, but you're not there emotionally or mentally um, because you um, believe you need to be or because it's mandated. Uh, thoughts? Okay, this is good because as a matter of fact, this um, topic uh, is emerging in some of the conversations that we're having across campus in different spaces around um, how, do we, how do we support our professional community to do their best uh, in the conditions that we have to navigate. So thank you, we'll make it a point. Any other questions or thoughts? Yes. Hi, good afternoon. Um, you guys can hear me, right? I got no? Okay, the mic is good. All right. Um, this question for Officer Flores, I, or Chief Flores, sorry. Um, and I really appreciate you kind of walking us through kind of the trainings and the um, ways in which we're reviewing policies and fostering trust with the community. I was wondering if I could ask you like a theoretical question. <laughs> okay. Um, so I want to know what you would do in this safety um, scenario. Uh, a female faculty member feels she is being stalked on campus and online by a student. As an example of the on-campus stalking, uh, the faculty finds that the student is following her during a time when the student should be in class. She comes to you to address her concerns. What would you do in this scenario? That specific scenario will take the information. From the, from the reporting party with the professor. We also have to connect that with our care team because we also manage that from that aspect because it, it could also be a Title IX issue, right? So we loop in the care team, Bridget, as far as Title IX, we would refer them as well to mention that to Title IX so they can, that's another avenue, right, for them to report. Uh, but what we would do is check, see what that student was and see if there's any other behavioral issues as part of the care team. So that's some stuff that goes on in the background. And then loop back with the professor and provides any more resources and to provide an update as to what we can discuss with them regarding the student and the behavioral issue. But it's more, uh, it's, it's not just the police, right? It's Title IX, it's a career care team because there might be other stuff that's going on with the student that we may not be aware of. So, yeah. Great question, okay. Um, okay, uh, thank you for that. That's really helpful to kind of see that, how you are holistically working together. So that's really good. Um, I think I'll actually ask the follow-up question afterwards. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, panel. Um, to introduce myself briefly, my name is Lisa Dickinson. I'm the interim director for campus recreation as well as the senior associate director for University Student Union. I myself um, am so thankful for the thoughtful and comprehensive information today. Um, it's also uh, proud to say I've been here for 17 years and grown up with a campus. Um, so my question is, as we see and really experience the next transition of growth for San Marcos, I am so happy and, and hopeful that we can continue to improve the way that we approach safety for our students, staff, and faculty. I think with the growth of our local area, there is still a need to think and consider how we can support those individuals that are not part of our campus community. Those individuals that may present as, but 
again, in my roles, there's also the need for me to continue to be that good steward of student dollars, right, and our state funds and protect those resources and access for the students that are paying for them. So it's a delicate balance. I know it's a difficult thing, but I hope that we can continue that conversation so that we are fair and we're emphasizing that care and concern that we want to provide, but also ensuring that that resource um, can be the appropriate direction, whether that is intended to be a community direction for those resources for um, an individual not within our community, and obviously connecting directly to our on-campus uh, services, so thank you. Yeah, Lisa, thank you. Thank you, um, Lisa. If I, if I may jump in. Uh, thank you for bringing that. Um, what, what we're seeing is, um, so a, a number of thoughts. I think, um, I've, I've been here for a long time. Um, prior to being here, I worked 11 years at San Diego State, which is a large, very urban institution. Um, so we, I think it's important for us as we plan for the future to realize that, um, you know, 20 years ago when I started, um, Twin Oaks Valley Road stopped at Craven, you know, the intersection of Craven. Um, we, we were almost rural and we're suburban and we're quickly urbanizing. Um, the density of the population that will be surrounding the university is something that we need to be, be very cognizant of. I think what we have also seen across the country is with, um, our, with inflation, with everything that's happened, um, certainly it was an issue pre-COVID, but it's only been exacerbated, and that's um, members of our community who don't have sufficient resources. So we know that in terms of our students, who are, are um, insecure for their basic needs, but also for people who aren't affiliated with the campus, but may find solace or refuge in the library or in a, a spot in the USU. Um, and so one of the things, and I, I wanna uh, give a shout out to um, Dean Jennifer Fabi, who made the connection for us, um, but Jesse and I will be meeting in a week or two um, with someone in San Marcos who um, is, is providing some more of those community-based um, resources. I, I also you know, have learned over time how much um, our, our university police provide information. So if they interact with someone who may be um, kind of causing a bit of a, a disruption, so not affiliated with the campus, but maybe causing a disruption in the library, for example, that they do provide information. Um, another aspect to the, the crisis response team that, that I spoke to earlier is potentially having that kind of warmer, not that it's not warm, but having another kind of set of, of hands to make that warm handoff into a community-based resource so that we're able to connect um, folks that aren't affiliated with us with um, the broader resources of the general community. So, um, One of the other things that we're seeing as we add more housing is that we're becoming a, a destination of um, other students visiting us. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to point out is we do also have partnerships with Palomar, Miracosta, SDSU, USD that we communicate regularly with and um, really make sure that when other folks are also visiting campus that we um, might help um, and partner with other universities or local co uh, community colleges. Thank you, thank you all. We are 10 minutes to the hour and I know that um, we're supposed to conclude at this point. Um, closing thoughts, um, I think they gave much of the closing remarks. We have a growing uh, community, our campus is growing. With that growth comes uh, experiences that are dynamic, um, that will impact how we experience safety, physically, emotionally, environmentally, individually, and collectively. And it's gonna require all of us working together to create a safe uh, and healthy working and learning environment for everyone. It's not just the people who have the safety um, credentials and the safety badge, um, but it's all of us in support of that ideal. It's also important to realize that we experience safety with some degree of disparity or difference, okay? It's not equitable. Safety is not an equitable dynamic. It's not an equitable experience. And um, it's important for us to use our 
wisdom and accountability partners to help us see the blind spots when we're leading or we're supporting others in the pursuit of, of safety. Uh, many have a healthy degree of apprehension when it comes to engaging around safety and safety issues on this campus. And it's okay to have a healthy degree of apprehension, but it's not okay not to participate in partnership for safety, for a safe environment. So thank you for being here. This is the first of many conversations that we're gonna have as we grow and move into the future. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.